ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Somos Moss, the official podcast of Somos Moss NM and your source for the latest news and notes on the Mexico United and the New Mexico Runners. My name, of course, is Seth Bidoff. I am the man you cannot see. And joining me this evening, we have the one and only awesome truth, Jacob Terrell, Earl Nieto. Guys, what a phenomenal weekend. I mean, not only do we see New Mexico United come back, come and do, do something that we've rarely ever seen them do. We saw them do it in spectacular fashion, and we also saw the crowning of a brand new champion. Earl, you've been waiting, and I promise you we will talk WrestleMania tonight if you ever get the licorice that you're done. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's like an hour-long licorice. Jesus. <laughs> Okay, maybe we won't get to WrestleMania tonight. I, I mean, we, we promised Earl we would talk about it, but now he's got licorice. So Earl, I, Earl probably isn't going to be able to talk the whole episode. <laughs> I, I mean, to be fair. Let me know when it's WrestleMania time. I'll let you know. <laughs> Did you even watch the match, Earl? How dare you? <laughs> All, how do I know? The group message was nothing but WrestleMania for 48 hours. There were, the only <laughs> United stuff was me. That was it. So how was I? I don't know what you guys watched. <laughs> <laughs> and Josh, you are correct. It is L L L L El Paso. You are correct, sir. So um, yes, I did watch the match, not live, obviously, um, because <clears throat> in this weird world that we live in, as Jacob takes the call, um, WWE was my first love. And then soccer came in. So soccer is a mistress. Okay. Um, I, I, I guess that's fair. I, I guess it's a fair analogy there, Earl. Um, but yeah, it was just, it, it was a phenomenal weekend. I, I do ask, I do, I do want to question this though, because as we were texting Saturday night, you said you were multitasking. Now, did you, I took that to mean you were watching both at the same time. Like I was. I had United on one screen, WrestleMania on the other, and just having a whole lot of fun with Saturday night. And then it carried on over into Sunday. We'll get to, like I said, hopefully you'll finish your licorice and we'll get to that later. But, I mean, were you so, not watching both? Of course I was. Okay. But my attention was more on WrestleMania, especially seeing Damian Priest. Or that was night two. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, seeing... There was a lot happening night one. So I was multitasking and watching the match on my phone, which is about the size of. We know how big phones this, are. <laughs> in comparison to this licorice, it's like a fourth of it. Mm. Um, so on that tiny screen there, I was trying to watch the match. So I didn't really get a chance to watch the match match and get the details that I wanted to. Mm -hmm. So I went back and rewatched it. Uh, uh, Jacob, obviously you watched it live. I watched it live. And this is one of those, like I mentioned a few minutes ago, this is something we haven't seen United do a whole lot of. I mean, not only did we come back from behind after surrendering two late goals, we then won this match. Yeah. And I think we discussed it a lot, a lot last year. I feel like we could probably count on one hand still the number of times that this club has come from behind to pick up three points. And let alone even pick up a single point. Uh, so I, I mean that late. Yeah. I think I think we've done a little bit better in the last year or so uh, of coming back after giving up an early goal, maybe, mm -hmm. and you know, leveling it in the first half still. And then but but nothing as dramatic and as late as as what we saw Saturday night. I mean, it was basically the 90th minute we score an equalizer and then 92nd minute, whatever it was, we score score the winner and so just absolute madness for sure it absolutely was i, I do have one question before we get into our recap did we hire jj abrams to give us this many lens flares <laughs> i mean and, and no slight against you know wind fire productions and no slight against the club and the setup and anything it's just we gotta figure out something better we really do. And uh, yes, yeah, it's called our own way. stadium, Seth. That's the only option. That's I, the only way to fix this. <laughs> well, I would I would think that we could at least, you know, set up, you know, off center or something. And it may look a little odd, you know, 
but I, I think it would give us a better option instead of staring into the sun for the first 45 minutes of the match. But I mean, they, they did what they could with the weather. And we know that this is a common. We know that with the, when the wind kicks up, like it does, it's going to affect the broadcast. There are going to be changes. And the, one of the things that, I, that really bothered me about the broadcast, and I don't think it was the broadcast itself. I could not hear this referee's whistle at all in this game. I don't know about you guys, but there were times where I wasn't hundred percent sure what was going on because pe- guys, the players were just kind of stop and like mill around. And then, you know, even when, even on the penalty call that we'll see here in a minute, you couldn't hear the whistle. You could not hear anything. You're, you're, there's no, I you no know, telling what the stoppages in play were. And I don't know, but maybe it's just me, but it bothered me that I couldn't hear this and I couldn't tell what was going on after the time. I, I didn't watch the broadcast, mm. but I, I, I watched some highlights of the broadcast. Like I, I before well, I didn't watch the highlight package necessarily. I went to the full match re or re the full match replay on ESPN Plus and watched fast forwarded to the parts that I wanted to watch, and I didn't notice anything. But like I said, I also wasn't watching everything. So, see, be like Jane, watch it twice. I, I we could all be like Jane. If I didn't have to drive two and a half hours back from the match, I would have rewatched it, <laughs> but <laughs> could not do that. With the very, very had. true. Yeah, I just I, I wanted to hit a couple of those points there before we really got into this because there, there's a lot to unpack from this match here. So much. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, the Mexico United comes out and gets an early goal, goes up 1-0 in the seventh minute. Then it gives up two late goals, uh, the second of which came on a penalty uh, that was converted by Armando Moreno to put um, uh, El El Paso up 2-1. And then you see some absolutely – you can call them brilliant subs. You absolutely can. Uh, To see Jacobo Reyes and Daniel Bruce come on there at the end of the match – at a time where you think, okay, there's so little time left. Could, what sort of impact could they have? And they turned the match on its absolute head. And United, there, there are four goals in the final 12 minutes of this match. Yeah. And the United comes from behind to win this match 3 2. It lives El Paso, their fourth loss of the season. United stays third in the Western Conference. Moved and up to third. what's that? We moved up to third. Yeah, moved up to third. And there's so many things went well in this match. There's also some things that did not go well, but it's just, I mean, where do we start here? I mean, I think we have to start with the play of the midfield. I think we have to look at what they did early to generate that first goal that New Mexico United had. I, to me, it wasn't the midfield. It was Harris almost single-handedly Harris. He was wreaking havoc on that left side from the first whistle until he he basically created or had a hand in creating every chance we had in the first half, including the goal. Mm-hmm. And him losing him at halftime, you could really see in the second half where to kind of switch up what we were doing. And that in the second half, you can say that the midfield kind of took over because that was when we had to change a little bit of our plan as far as how we were going to attack and break them down. And it wasn't so much just, hey, let's break them down with speed on the wings. Let's do a little bit more tactically, but Harris in the first half was just absolutely insane. He constantly was getting behind uh, the big, I called him Gunther all night. I don't know what his name is. Um, the the big tall number 15 guy and uh, Dallenmeyer, maybe Dallenmeyer, yeah. Um, was constantly just getting in behind him. And because El Paso was playing with wingbacks that were pushing so high up, there was just, a ton of space back there for him to get in behind. And, and you see it on the goal, he gets in behind and then is able to put in a cross on the first goal. That is he he's able to get in behind and then, and puts a ball across that everybody smartly lets go. And, and Marco Micheletto gets his first goal with New Mexico United, just an absolute rocket from just outside the 18 that honestly was, was one of the best struck balls I've seen in person in a long, long time. Yeah, I know. And we'll back up the highlight package here so we can go back and look at this. But, you know, you saw from the from the early moments of this game, you know, you talk about what? Dayon Harris getting in behind and working up that, up that left wing. And that was something that stood out to me 
throughout the night for both clubs. Both clubs were on were working the left wing on their mm -hmm. attacking side. Earl, when you watch this, you know, particularly from us as a defensive standpoint, and we'll get to day on here in a minute. This is something we've seen a few times throughout the season. Our right way, our, our right side of the fence getting worked by defenders. What do you think it is about that side that gives clubs like El Paso and what they were trying to do on Saturday? What do you think it, they're seeing that makes them want to try to attack that side? Now, obviously it wasn't working, but why did they keep going to that throughout the night? Really? I don't know. My, my, I, I noticed that throughout the match that they kept trying. Um, my thought is that they were trying to exploit Astorga to try to push up a little more and then get right past him. But he was he was solid on Saturday night. He was he was really good. He didn't make any major mistakes. He definitely kept his kept his position and where he needed to be. Um, why they kept going to it, I don't know. Maybe they were hoping to catch him off guard, but it wasn't working. So Jacob mentioned the play of us on the left wing as well. You you look at you know how Dayon was playing and how he was able to get him behind. Do you think it was a mismatch for Dayon on that side? Do you think you know, I, you know obviously you talk about you know, I'm trying to exploit a store guy? Were we doing the same thing? Was it because of the positioning of their fullbacks, or do you think Dayon and the and and the midfield are just reading something into this and seeing opportunities to get him behind. Dayon's just next level. I mean, he's he's on a different level compared to anybody. He's really good. Um, and I think he, they use the same tactics that we that El Paso was trying to do with us is exploit that side of the field, and their back isn't as fast as Dayon is. That's for sure. Um, he's not as skilled defensively as Dayon is offensively. I mean, Dayon on the ball, I mean, you saw it pass there. He passed it past two people to Marco to score. I mean, mm -hmm. he sees he sees the play happening before it actually happens, and it's nice. It's actually it's some leadership that we have on the field without even having it be a leader. Yeah, no, I agree. When you have someone that can make those sorts of reads, make those sorts of runs, and and you see how on that run in, in the lead up to the goal, him dragging the center back out with him, leaving all that open space. And Jacob, you talked about the fact that you know there were guys in United who kind of who just backed away from the ball, let it go and let it lay. We uh, I mean I'll back it up one more time. Like if you go back and look at this when it comes up, there's really not a whole lot of options there in the box for Dayon to get that ball too. Do you think uh, watching this, do you think he saw that run coming up from Marco or do you think he was just playing it back across the box in the hopes that, you know, that someone would get on it? Was that to me? Sorry. Yes. Okay. Uh, no, I think, I think it was, it's a planned, uh, kind of set play there, not a set play, but a, a, a tactic that they were wanting to bring out with with Marco making that late run to the edge of the box. And if you if you have that clip of Marco talking about the goal, um, I had two clips of him talking about it. But in one of them, he mentions uh, them working on him getting to that edge of the box and, and being prepared for something like that. And and so I think it's definitely a a planned thing where they're gonna try to exploit the runners going forward and then having him come in and, and kind of clean up. Yeah. Speaking of, I think we've got that here. Well, uh, I think this is the right one. Looks like it. I don't have sound. Do y'all have sound? Hmm? I, I thought this was like a lip reading challenge. Is it not? Okay, hang on. I, I don't hear anything. All I right, thought I lost my hearing for a couple seconds. For no. First time doing this, guys. Hold, hang with us. It, it, no, trust no, me, no. Marco uh, Marco on the mic is uh, worth To be ride. honest, I was so happy I got to do it in front of the stand right here. You know, it was a massive reason why I came to the club was because of the supporters. I wanted to walk into a stadium and I wanted to feel 9, 10, 11,000 people backing me, right? Uh, I'd never had that in my life, never. And so that's what, that's really, I told Gaffer, I told Peter, I told everybody, that's why I wanted to come to New Mexico. And so 
I would have loved to have scored in either goals, don't get me wrong, but to do it under this one here and to then be able to just... It was one of those, you don't get too many personal wins, but that felt like one. I got to fucking just go up and, you know, just soak it in. And that's what I made sure I did, and I don't think I'll forget that. So with him cussing, does that allow me to cuss now? <laughs> or when have we ever stopped you from cussing? Yeah, have we ever stopped you? So he doesn't mention it in that one, but he does mention it in another clip uh, that I might not have sent you where it's a, it's something that they worked on him getting to the edge of the box. But hey, what with that clip there, like if for those of you that are listening that were there, even though it was a little bit lower than usual, 9,000, you know, we didn't quite hit the 10,000 mark. With the weather that we had, having that many and then we were loud like they were loud the whole match and and marco mentions like that's the whole reason he came here was he had never played in front of that many people and and so that's one of the main if not the sole reason obviously there's other reasons but what but the main reason why he he came to new mexico united and for him to score that you could tell how much it meant to him i've got another clip i, I don't know if you've got it keyed up of him celebrating but um you, you just get you could tell that it meant a lot of them. I did not rename that one. My bad. My bad. Yeah. All good. All good. So it must be this one. <laughs> There you go. Yeah. And so <laughs> so he was he was fired up. He was fired up all night uh, and for good reason, of course. Yeah, no, absolutely. You, you look at the way that he played and he obviously contributed, you know, later on as well. Um, but when you go back and you watch the way that this team played, and this was something that we have been you know, dying to see. We've been dying to see that, you know, that last minute, you know, goal. We've been dying to see the full 90. And Earl watching this performance, even when you had, even when you did go back and watch it, not live, like the rest of us, you know, what are some of your biggest takeaways here from how this club played down the stretch in this match? Well, whenever I don't even know who scored the first goal, I know they did. Um, well, I know we scored the first the first one. I don't remember who on El Paso scored that second goal. Um, it was uh, Joaquin Rivas, and then Rivas. Um, he yeah. came off the bench and then scored like six minutes in. Mm -hmm. Um, when they scored, I said, "Okay, cool." We're going to take a draw. We'll take one point. Um, and then when Amando scored, see, I was kind of in and out watching all of it at the same time. Um, so when I saw that. I was like, all right, cool. Once Amando, once Amando scored, it was already the 80 something, 87th minute. I think it was, I figured, all right, we're done. We're not, we're not walking with anything on this one, but then we didn't stop. And we kept trying and kept trying and kept trying. And then Brucey, and Hokobo comes on, and those are my standout players. Um, I know Jacob was asking for standouts. Those are my two standouts because they came in and they just turned the game upside down. Um, when they came on and then we scored to make it 2-2, two -two, I figured, well, shit, we got a chance at this thing. And then getting that last goal, um, I felt the same emotion as I did Sunday night. Where grown men go to cry. Your bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're not giving no. a whole lot of context here, Earl. You're I'm like, talking about, talking about. I'm talking about when Cody Rhodes won the title. Spoiler alert, by the way. <laughs> I, I mean, you. Know, to be fair. Sunday night was very emotional for you, Earl, because you know your your tribal chief lost his title. I, you'll get over it; it'll be okay. Um, but you know, I, I think riding high off the emotion of this of this match on Saturday, I think this is a huge moment, and we're still early in the season for this club. I think this gives them confidence going forward that hey, we can come from behind, we can respond to these, and you know, you you. Jacob, you had another clip here from, yeah. from Marco, and we'll uh, we'll pull that one up as well. Um, that one I actually do have keyed up. So today was a prime example, and as I said, like it's something that is installed with us Monday through Friday. And when we went two one down, 
there was a general belief. We looked around, and I looked around at the boys, and everybody knew we was going to get at least one more chance, and we was going to take it away because that's because that's what good teams do, and we're a good team. It's good to see that confidence. It, it, it really is because. And maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I feel like in the past, and we've I think we've heard the players talk about it, where they where they do kind of drop their heads. They do kind of switch off at times in the past, but there's something different about this group. Is it Quill? Is it the players? Jacob, what do you think it is that's bringing out this belief in themselves more? I, than what we I, think, I think Marco mentions it in that clip. You know, it's a Monday through Friday thing. It's, it's in training the... Uh, the the work that they have to put in and the depth that this team has, like you cannot take a training day off. If you take a training day off, the depth here is is very very good, and you could lose your spot like that if you have an off couple of days on the training pitch. And so that mixed with this mentality that Quill and them Quill and the coaching staff have. And, and I think the coaching staff or the, the mentality of these players, I mean, you talk about Marco Micheletto coming from Columbus crew too. They win a championship there. Obviously it's MLS next pro. I get it. It's not like the world cup, but it's still a trophy playing against their peers. He was also a captain of that team. You have talent Maples, Houston Dynamo too, was a captain of that team. You have all these pieces that are coming in that are top quality have the mentality of no, we're going to get this done. And, and we've seen that now, obviously the Rhode Island match, notwithstanding and the Columbus crew match or not Columbus crew, um, Charleston battery match, notwithstanding we've seen the fight and the grit in these one, nothing wins against Pittsburgh and, and Phoenix in Phoenix, nonetheless. And then, and then tonight, I mean, I've I've never had a club that I follow go down in the this is the penalty here. It happens in like the 82nd minute, 87th minute. I don't remember. Yeah. 80 just over just into the 87th minute is when um he who shall not be named um scores scores this PK. And and the the feeling in the stadium was just dejection. I mean, it was just you can almost see it there where the flags are flying and then not all of them, but 90% of them when he scores, just stop. And I was on the other side of the pitch and you could just hear like an audible, like the air just being sucked out and for them to turn around. And then two minutes later, Marco does this and Reyes gets on the end of it after coming in, being that super sub that we talked about. Josh brings up a good point though. Um, we, I was sitting on the far side with another gentleman um, that I'm not going to out right now. Um, but me and him were both sitting there saying, like, where are the subs? Like, before they even took the lead, it was like, where are the subs? Like, in the 80th minute, before they even really scored, it was, where are the subs? And, I mean, it, it worked out in the end. I would have liked to have seen some subs sooner. But the subs come on. Jacobo Reyes, who we saw be instrumental in the goal against Pittsburgh. Um, comes in and, and makes a beautifully timed run and gets on the end of a, a Marco ball and, and puts it in. Do you have that clip keyed up by chance? Nakobo, Marco talks about look, Reyes here. I'm going to, yeah, me and Nakobo, like, we click. He knows where I want the ball and I know where he wants the ball. Um, it was in a moment of the game when we needed to get something. So I remember I looked up and I was just trying to squeeze something somewhere and we made a quick eye contact and I knew where it was where he wanted to go. But make no mistake about it, as much as I'm proud of that ball, what a finish, because that is a tough, tough goal. Come the ball coming over your shoulder to head it over the goal. So, Okobo was fantastic, but um, I love playing with him. He's a fantastic player, what can I say? So, I mean, that eye contact and then putting the ball, I mean, that's insane. That, that play from where he's at on the field for that to happen, I mean we're just going to watch it. I'm, I'm just going to be speechless and watch it for a second. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like, I, nasty. 
Yeah, the placement on that on that cross, the place the 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 placement on the header, and like like Marco said, that is not easy. No, no, and they they but they linked up. They they made that eye contact. He knew where he wanted it, like you said, and and um, <laughs> I, I love it. I love <laughs> he's, it. He's it's just flat footed, there. like he just stuck. Yeah, like, he's yeah. just standing there, and he's just yeah. like, oh, okay, here you go, inch perfect ball over the back line. Yeah, and my favorite thing, I pick I. It drives me nuts when our players do it, but I love to see it when El Paso does it. Is that that hand going up before the play is even over? Mm-hmm. Be like, oh no, you and and then the flag doesn't come. You don't get saved just because you think it's offside. It's got to actually be offside, and it was not. Yeah. I, I can I can guarantee you it was not. And so, just absolutely beautiful, the ability by Marco throughout the match, by Reyes and Brucey coming on, just. It's something that you just, you don't see. I mean, we have this here. Bruce, he's like by himself. There, look at that. There's three white shirts, four white shirts before Nikki comes into the picture and plays it perfectly. And then Nikki with a, just an incredible finish. I, so right here, oh, they, if you go back or if you watch that again, you can see two little pink shirts behind the goal right after we score. They're going to be one on your left and one on your right. And they start running towards each other. You can kind of see them start running towards each other there. They're the two ball boys. They like jump hugged, like just were ecstatic. And I a tear came to my eye, bro. I mean, it was just it was just such a crazy moment to go from when he who shall not be named scores the penalty and my head just dropped and I was so dejected and just like not to say like once we started once the game started back up, I had some hope. But in that moment, as soon as he scores, just, oh, man, it was just so rough. And to go from that to all of a sudden scoring twice in like a two and a half minute span, the emotions were just all, I mean, I was I was a wreck. The whole stadium was a wreck. And for it to be, like, if this was, if this happened literally any other time in any other match, it would be an incredible feeling. Yeah. But for well, it to be El Paso. Yeah just meant so much to everybody in the stadium, including myself, just because of how much we despise El Paso. And I want to bring this up. Wait, you talk about day on speed in the 98th minute. He's still out running people or not. They on that. It was, it was on the left at that point. That was, um, Brucey was over there. And then Nikki no, for, comes this, in. for this last shot. Here. Oh, the last one. Yeah. Who, who was that? Oh, who is that? I think it's, um, Oh, I can't not remember. It oh. happened right in front of me. It's got to be Gloucester. It's Gloucester. Yeah, it's it? Gloucester. Yeah, it's yeah. got to be Gloucester. It's a Gloucester who've been out there for the full ninety, mm. outpacing people out there on the left wing. I, sorry, I don't. I you know I know it wasn't Dayon because he was already out. But yeah, yeah. Speaking of which, we got to talk. We're going to talk about Dayon here in a minute. But I mean, we Earl, we saw Brucey play the nine last year, several different opportunities, and here we see him come in once again for Greg Hurst. Now. Obviously, Brucey didn't get a goal in this one, but the impact that, that he had on this match for even the final, what it ended up being in what nine minutes of stoppage time in the second mm. half, which I thought was just ridiculously too long. Um, mm. I, I mean, to be fair, we have one goal on stoppage time, and that was it. There shouldn't, ha- I, there should have been, maybe yeah, but there was, and there was the seconds, there was the PK. They, yeah, but that's Nikki, all Nikki celebrated. Nikki celebrated that pretty, pretty good because I think it was they called for eight to begin with, right? Seven. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I so I mean, an, an extra I two minutes. Bit. Like I, I think that was really pushing it. And I'm sitting here going, blow the damn whistle. Like this yeah. one needs to be. This needs Trust to be me. over. I like, by that time I had moved right over to where Nikki and them celebrated right in front mm-hmm. of that, um, that corner. And while I was standing there, everybody was like, blow the whistle, blow the whistle, blow the whistle, for like the last five minutes of the match. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, but Earl, I mean, looking at Brucey and how he played tonight, I, I I can't think of a reason to I have a hard time putting Brucey on the bench. But is this now Brucey's role to come in and be super sub rotation guy? And if this is the kind of impact that we expect to see from him throughout the rest of the season. I think I'm okay with that. I mean, looking at what he did in just a few minutes he had, what are your thoughts on Brucey and his new, almost new role with the club? Uh, do I like seeing Brucey on the bench? No, I don't. Um, 
But yes, he is owning that spot as if it's his. Um, and he proved it on Saturday where he came in and he made he made one of the biggest impacts of the matches where he had the assist that was the game winner. Um, yeah, where he was the game the game winning assist pretty much. So Brucey coming on off the bench off the bench is a good spot because he is ferocious and he he's tenacious like he doesn't stop going so he's essentially a carbon copy of Tanari plus like four others four other Tanaris added in there I would um be more offensive minded than Tanari but the tenacity there is definitely definitely good either way Either way, um, I, I I like him coming off the bench just because of his energy that he brings off the bench that catches the opposing team off guard. I mean, it's El Paso. We played them a million and a half times. I think they're practically our wives at this point. Um, but we still we bring Be- Brucey off the bench, and he's still – surprises them and make some kind of statement. Yeah, no, great performance by Brucey. Uh I'm surprised Marco Micheletto did not get team of the week. He got he's, he had an honorable mention. He's on the bench. He's yeah. on the bench. Yeah. I, I felt like he should have been in the in in the starting eleven. I, I was surprised week. to not see him yeah. on the team of the week for sure. While we're there, quickly shout out to former New Mexico United players Alexi Alexi Swahi and Justin Portillo both making team of the week last week. So shout out to them. Great performance by Tulsa. That was a lot of fun to watch. I don't know if you guys saw it or not. But. I did. I did watch that on Friday night. It was pretty good. So while he gets on the on the score sheet, uh, mm-hmm. Portillo has two assists. I mean, uh, really good showing. So while he's one that I really wish we would have held on to. Um, but he, I think he needed to get some confidence. He went down to League One last year mm-hmm. and was League One Defender of the Year, if I'm not mistaken, and, and then is able to come up and get a chance with Tulsa. A lot of the times, there's three New Mexico United, former New Mexico United players on Tulsa because Tete usually starts for them too. He was not in the 18 though. So, mm-hmm. but yeah, um, shout out to them for sure. Yeah. And plus, they sold the points for Phoenix Rising. So, you know, we'll, we will definitely take that every day of the week. Um, but so we've, we've talked about a lot of the good. Okay. We've talked about a lot of the good things that New Mexico United did. We talked about the pace. We talked about, you know, the, the passes that we've seen, we've talked about the improved play through the midfield. Um, what were some of the issues that we saw? What did we not do well against El Paso on Saturday night? We, what were our weak spots and where do you think that we, you, where do you think we could have done a little bit better, Jacob? Well, I think I, I can't necessarily pinpoint exactly like tactically what it was. Um, in, in, in the post game presser coach Quill, and Marco talk about it in in other clips that I that we don't have queued up here, where coach specifically said, you know, we scored that seventh minute goal, and he was really hoping to see us, you know, build on that and kind of take over. And instead, he he said we for whatever reason kind of shut down and, and let El Paso control the match, and that's exactly what happened. And so that was that was tough to see. Marco mentions it too. He's he's talks about in another clip where he's really happy about scoring that goal, but he was really disappointed in the next 35 minutes of that half after scoring that goal and seeing El Paso kind of get chance after chance. I mean, Amando had like four shots in the first half um, and, and couldn't luckily couldn't put one away, but they were there down that left side. Like you mentioned, El Paso's left side. And, and you asked Earl about it earlier, but I I think they're attacking that left side because, you know, we play with the back four, but in, in possession, Astorga really gets up and mm-hmm. Gloucester doesn't Gloucester kind of stays back. So that right side isn't really open because you got Gloucester over there and then you've got the two center backs in the middle of the pitch. Whereas with Storga bombing forward, it leaves that space. And, and I think it's something that we obviously are aware of. It's a game plan that we want to have with Astorga coming forward. And we've done a fairly good job of, Yes, they they get to that space, but we are organized enough in the back to not let them getting into that space end up hurting us. I think tonight or Saturday night was probably the worst that we've seen as far as defensively on that from that aspect. We saw it against Pittsburgh quite a bit, but other than that first little flurry of corners in the first few minutes, 
they would get to that space, but then we were able to have enough speed and, and number and bodies get back to where they couldn't exploit it in any way, shape or form. But Amando had a few good looks coming from that side. And Amando had a few good dribbles where he, he beat a player here and there to create something. And so all in all, I think the defense, it's hard to say the defense played well in, in a game that you give up two goals, but kind of like last year, those were two goals that were just two moments of, of brain farts for lack of a better term. I mean, it's just, it's, it's one where we have plenty of numbers back, but Justin Dillon, who's a big talented guy is able to get past talent on the dribble and get into space. And, and it's just, once you get compromised like that, it's hard to, make it a make make up for it so i'm not going to put it all on talent obviously but even even the best defenders i think get beat one-on-one every once in a while and so it just it sucked and it happened and we moved on and then the penalty was just zico getting a little little too aggressive there we had plenty of numbers back we had plenty of bodies between um i think it was dylan that got fouled again or was it um was it dylan or was it rivas rivas i don't remember one of those two big guys, um, we had plenty of numbers between him and the ball or him and the goal. Um, and Zico just kind of sticks a foot in there kind of willy nilly shouldn't have done it. And, and it's going to be a foul every time, uh, if there's contact and the guy goes down in that situation. So just two moments of, of letting down. So I think my biggest thing was we've seen, this team attack and attack and attack and attack, even like Pittsburgh, right? We score in like the 15th minute or 17th minute or something like that. I might be way off. I don't remember for sure, but we scored fairly early in the first, first half. No, we scored late in the first half. I don't remember. 40, we score. 40th minute. Okay. So we score and then we keep attacking. We keep attacking. And for whatever reason on, on Saturday we scored and then we just kind of like shut off. And I don't know what that is. I don't know if it's just emotions running really high and we get the lead, and I don't, I don't know what it is. But that, that to me, was what we could have done better, was stayed with that attacking mindset that we've had for the first five matches here and and continue that even after going 1-0 one up, one oh up and, and we didn't do that, which is a problem, I think. But Quill mentions it. Marco mentions it. And so it's, it's something that I, I can guarantee you will get addressed in the next two weeks before our next league match. Earl, what about you? What what's something that stood out to you? We talked about the positives. What what was something you saw as an issue on Saturday night? Jacob nailed it on the head. I mean, whenever we and it sucks because it's kind of a, a broken record here, but as soon as we scored, we kind of hit the brakes a little bit. Definitely laid back and tried to, I guess, soak it in that we scored a goal. Um, I don't know what what happened, but it was obvious that. El Paso took control during those 25 to 30 minutes where they, I think after we scored, Amando had three shots, two shots in the next five, 10 minutes. Um, so we definitely kind of laid back a little bit to see how they'd respond and then kind of pulled her head out and then decided to finish the game. All right. We got one more clip from uh, from Marco before we move on. And I want to play this for you guys here real quick. And this, I believe this is Marco talking about the rivalry, which obviously played a big factor in this weekend rivalry match. A lot was made of Amado Moreno in his return. But here's what Marco had to say. Really cool. Um, I'm, you know, I'm Italian where rivalries are all over. Like I'm a big Roma fan today. We won the derby. We won the derby tonight again. It, it doesn't it's not lost on me what it mean what it means to the people i like to put myself in their shoes and understand you know uh, i want to go home and make sure that these guys go home thinking like yeah we won our rivalry game you know um obviously look i've been here 20 minutes i'm not going to be like yeah i feel it in my blood right. uh, but when i wear this crest then i have to represent these people and these people don't like those people and you know then i'm out there doing doing everything i can to make sure that this wins so, I mean, taking into account what Marco said here about the rivalry and looking at the the importance of of the derby, of the derby, and looking at the, the return of Amanda Moreno, I mean, obviously Moreno gave a bit of a 
celebration. He was he, his return. Did it live up to the hype? Did the match itself live up to the hype? Did the rivalry does it does it make the rivalry more intense now that we have him playing down there? You know, I know there's a couple of different questions in there, but however you want to attack this portion of it. I so one, he pointed to the El Paso fans. Mm-hmm. That's that's all he did. And then he did not partake in anything. He he did show some class there. Um that being said, I don't know, man. It honestly it felt a little as far as like on the pitch and the players on the pitch, it kind of felt a little lesser if that makes sense okay I, I think with two clubs that come in like for el paso we didn't have borelli who's the troll an instigator mm-hmm. we didn't have yuma who's an instigator um we didn't have we didn't have you know hamilton or suggs some of these players that have have been in the thick of this for for several years um and then brucey who's been here obviously the longest doesn't start and then we have a ton of a uh, nude blood uh, on both sides of the pitch uh, in this rivalry. And so we didn't, we didn't see the chippiness that we normally see. And, and I think part of that honestly was Amando going over there. I think the players that we have on our team obviously might be upset with him going over there, but um, have respect for him for the four years that he spent in black and yellow with us. And so I didn't see a whole lot of back and forth with him and any of our players. I didn't see a whole lot of back and forth with their back line and our forwards or their keeper and our forwards. Cause it, it's just a lot of new blood. And so like Josh says, I mean, there were, it was way chippier against Phoenix. Um, and I, and I think especially with the way El Paso has been, just quality wise the last couple of years, especially since Quill's been there, then I, I'm not, I wonder if the players don't see them as, as big of a, a challenge as they do Phoenix um, at times. So it, it was kind of weird. Obviously the fans, it still meant the world to the fans. You could feel that for sure. But um, clearly but yeah. eighth notch was upset. Oh, well, the, okay. <laughs> I, I, I thought about sending you this clip mm-hmm. to play on the pod, but I didn't. But uh, my boy Phil, who looks a shit ton like Earl after watching that video, like kind of weird looking like Earl. Um, they they did a, a live watch along with Seriously Loco over there. And uh, when Nikki scores, it, I mean, just, I've watched that clip <laughs> probably 40 times. And that's not an exaggeration. If I just, oh man. Great. Is that the one that you sent to us? Yeah, yeah. When Phil says, fuck my life after Nikki yeah. scores. I, I right. haven't watched it yet. Um, been a little busy. Yeah. Bro, it's a 30 um, second clip. We've been here for 43 and a half minutes. You could have watched it at least <laughs> once since then. So at this point, Earl, does it make does this rivalry feel like it's being carried more by the supporters than it is the, any of the action on the pitch? No, I think release the clip. Um, I'll send it to you, Josh. How about this, Josh? Um, no, fuck, I'm gonna I'm gonna email it to you right now, Seth. You gotta play. Okay. Yeah. I was gonna say we're gonna put it on our social media, but that's cool too. No, I mean, we we'll can start. Yeah, we um so to answer your question, um no, I think the rivalry is still on the pitch as well. It's just like Jacob said, we're missing a lot of key players that have played the five years of the rivalry. I mean, Josh Suggs, Devin Sandoval, Bees, I mean, all the big names that played El Paso throughout the pandemic, before the pandemic, the Yuma, the Borellis, the Richie Ryans, the I mean, the list goes on and on. And then you're looking at the newer faces. I mean, you're missing Kalen, who is the heartbeat of the back line and definitely very chippy when it comes to El Paso. Um, so it's not that the on-pitch rivalry is dying out. It's that it was missing very key pieces of very key pieces of the mat of the aspect of the rivalry to I'm just trying to buy time till Seth gets that thing loaded. Um 
it was missing very key pieces that make the rivalry what it actually is. Bruce going forward. Hernandez. Fuck my life. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the dejection. So y'all saw it. Okay. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, uh. <laughs> this guy on the right wants to cry. <laughs> And this is bar- partly why Phil will never ever come on our show more than likely. <laughs> no, I'm playing this because he never tries. He never yeah. reaches out whatsoever. Oh man, so good, <laughs> so good. Uh, yeah. So uh, you know, eighth uh, notch, seriously local, seriously dejected after Saturday night. Um, but I think that's going to just about do it for our discussion on the Mexico United taking the win over El Paso by a final score of three to two. We don't have a match this week. We don't. So real quick, odd. real yeah, quick real though. Quick. Being there in person, I'm very sad that neither of you else, neither of you guys, were there. Um, it was to to experience it with nine other nine thousand other fans um, was absolutely crazy. It was it was a night. I, I tweeted it. I think I tweeted it, or, or I think it was a tweet. I don't remember. I social media is a blur. Um, like I've seen some pretty cool stuff in person. And and I don't think anything's going to top that as far as sports moments. I mean, it was was absolutely insane. And so shout out to the 9000 people that were there. And uh, I hope you didn't leave early because <laughs> that would have yeah, been a bummer. Exactly. I should be at the next home game, so I, I can't wait. Um, Good. Good. But yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a minute before that happens. Um, but quickly, before we move on around the Western Conference after the weekend. Orange County and Sac Republic both still sit atop the West on 11 points. Each side picked up a win at the weekend. Orange County 2-0 over Memphis 901 and Sacramento Republic 2-0 over Switchbacks. Obviously, New Mexico United sits third on 10 points after the win over El Paso. Las Vegas Lights sitting fourth right now with their third consecutive win in a row. Uh, San Antonio dropped some points this weekend. They are in fifth. Yeah, Monterey Bay in sixth after picking up their second win of the season. You got Rising seventh on four points. Tulsa on four points as well, down in eighth. And then you've got Oakland Roots, Memphis 901, four points, three points respectively. El Paso with one point through five matches. And Colorado Switchbacks, winless, the only winless team, pointless team, I should say, the only pointless team in the entire USL championship at this point. So Harry asked a question before the match was over on Saturday. Who was worse, uh, El Paso or, or Colorado? Your guys' thoughts on that question? Oh boy! Um, right as of right now, I have to say Colorado. Agreed. I have to say Colorado right now. Like I, I'm, I'm terribly disappointed in what they've been doing so far. Um, El Paso showing a bit of life, but I'm not seeing any sort of heartbeat out of Colorado right now. Agreed. Agreed. So. All right. Josh so- Seth is planning on being out there. Mm-hmm. I would love to try to make it. I still might try. There's a few days between now and then that I might change my mind, but but we'll have to see. Um, I really wanted to go. I wanted to go to Lubbock. If it was in Lubbock, I would have been there for sure. Um, yeah. To go to Rio Rancho, obviously, it's mainly I wanted to go to Lubbock just for the experience of going on an away trip. But um, but we will say, see. If you're going to be there, I can get you some photo credits. Where? Uh, oh, at the game? The, yeah, at the game. I can get you some, uh, some photo credits because I get... Cause I'm going to be doing like pulling that like quadruple duty next week. <laughs> if I, if, if, if I can, I'll let you know, yeah, but, um, perfect. But so I, I didn't ask you guys, I didn't prep you guys this whatsoever, mm-hmm. but looking at the East and the West, if you would, who's, who's your top five clubs in the league right now? Hmm. I'll, I mean, I, I'd say loose Diddy's dangerous so i'm gonna put loose city in my top five um detroit city is looking good battery i just don't i i I don't know if battery is going to be consistent enough but i like what battery is doing right now so i don't i don't know if you saw this but battery beat loose city three to two tonight Mm -hmm. yeah i don't know if i don't know if you knew that or if it changes your opinion at all but but that did that is something that happened yeah no, I, they're both playing well. 
They really are. Uh, and so I think I have to include both of them despite Lou City's loss today. And then I haven't seen much of Orange County and Sac Republic yet this year. I need to go back and watch some of their matches. But um, I would probably say us and Sac. Because I, I don't think Orange County's is going to be sustainable. I could be completely wrong. I mean, again, I need to go back and watch some of what they've done. Um, but that's where I'm at right now. Earl, do you want to tackle this or you want me to jump in there? It, it's too much for me to think. Okay, good, good, <laughs> good. Yeah, I think, I mean, you're, it's, you, you, I think the top five in some order are probably Lucidity, Charleston, And then Lou City, Charleston. I think I would have Sacramento up there um, just because they they have that sustain. They, I mean, they, they come off a really good year last year. They add Trevor Amon, who's been fantastic for them. And, and they're sitting there with 11 points. They haven't lost yet. Um, so I don't see how you could knock them down mm-hmm. uh, yet. And then the next two spots, so Detroit City, Orange County, and us, it's it's really tight. I think I would love to put us up there, but with some of the, you know, we have a 4-0 loss on there. We didn't look great against El Paso at times. We've we found a way to gut out performance or wins and get those performances that we need, but we haven't dominated per se like, like I don't we haven't had a two goal win like every other team on this list has so I think mm-hmm. I think I'd probably go even with the loss today because they were heavily rotated uh to begin the match today I'd have loose loose city and then probably Charleston and then Sacramento and then Orange County Detroit City or Detroit City Orange County um no welcome welcome that's okay. honestly I I, I dropped the ball today big time. I didn't put a post out this morning and I didn't put a post out right before we started because uh, life, but, uh, but, but glad you're here. Glad you're here. Yeah. Uh, quickly before I, I, we promised Earl, we're going to do WrestleMania. We're going to close out the show of WrestleMania. Did either of you watch the uh, USL match between loose city and um, sorry, I'm blanking, blanking, Indy blanking. 11. Indy 11 Indy. on, on you on CBS on Saturday. Did either of you watch it? I watched a couple minutes of it, but like I said, to start this show, um, my first marriage is to WWE, um, and second marriage is to soccer. Um, so I watched the first like half and then turned on the pre the pre show for for WrestleMania. Mm-hmm. Um, I like it on CBS. I mean, their quality of stream is crystal fucking clear. Yeah, I watched I watched the whole thing. Uh, from the intro to to the final whistle, and it looked incredible. Uh, Devin Kerr and Mike Watts were fantastic on the call. I know some people have issues with them. I think they're great. There was one. Uh, um, Jack Blake oh. scored a penalty, mm-hmm. and and uh, Mike Watts goes. Uh, so his hips did in fact lie, and. Devin Kerr was just fucking crickets and it, I mean, it, I died, but, yeah. and, and what a, what a performance on the pitch for it to be the first match on, on CBS leading into the final four. I mean, it, it couldn't have played out better. I mean, the production quality was mm-hmm. top notch. The, the match itself, I mean, eight goals. Lynn family stadium is one of the best looking stadiums on TV anyways. Um, and then you had just I it, everything was just fantastic about it. I'm I'm really excited for it. Hopefully we can get more matches on CBS like next year. I'm I'm very, very, very curious to see what the numbers are mm-hmm. for this match. Um it's Tuesday, they should be out. I just don't know where to find that kind of stuff unless somebody puts it on my Twitter feed. And so <laughs> I, I might have to dig in and, and look at that, but it was it was fantastic. Josh, it had to have been uh, connection issues because I watched it on my TV and it was just freaking gorgeous. So um, just a, a, a great thing for the USL. 
Uh, the game tonight was on CBS Sports Network. It looked really good tonight, too. Just the quality of everything in the USL is just kind of going up and up and up. Something that I, I've talked about with some others, um, both in person and in and, and DMs and stuff, is the quality of this league, like the product on the pitch itself, too. The quality is just, I mean, from 2019 to now, is it's just loads better. I mean, we talk about having a deeper team today than we did in 2019, but I think the whole club, the whole league is kind of deeper. And obviously there's what four, three or four less teams uh, with the MLS two teams leaving and then some other teams uh, rest in peace, Reno, um, Tulsa Roughnecks. Uh, obviously we have FC Tulsa now, but uh, rest in peace, some of those clubs, but um, the product on the pitch is just spectacular and, and it deserves what CBS gave it. Honestly. I mean, it, could you imagine if that El Paso match was on, on CBS with that kind of quality. I mean, that would have been like top notch television in that particular moment. So, yeah. so I, I, I think it's a great thing. I think it's a fantastic. <clears throat> yeah, no, absolutely. It was a great to see great broadcast and I can't wait to see more of the also, USL on CBS. I want to shout out Jane here. Um, the Nikki celebration, she said it was nearly right in front of her. Uh, she was crying too. So I wasn't the only one that shed tears after Nikki scored, I wanted to, to make sure that you guys knew that I wasn't the only one there. Um, and she's also talking about rewatching it on KOAT at 1030, which if you guys didn't know that uh, all the matches, I think it's all the matches or at least the home matches are being rebroadcast at 1030 after the 10 o'clock news on, on channel seven here locally. So that that's a really cool thing. And, and, um, had I wish, I wish I would have known you were there, Jane. Um, because I was right there too. I would have would have tried to find you. But uh, next match, next match for sure. Sorry, I, right. we, we've gone about an hour. I, I think it's about time. I, unless you got anything <laughs> else, Seth. Um, no. and you want? Should I close it out properly for the people that don't want to stick around for the wrestling content? I say go for it. Okay. Or right, you got anything else soccer related? Cool. All right. Nope. So at this point, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will be transitioning. Right, well, let me rephrase that. Seth and Earl will be transitioning to talk about WrestleMania while I make fun of them for doing it. Um, so with that being said, next week, kind of up in the air, the Open Cup match is going to be on Tuesday at 7, so it will still be going on at our normally normal time of 8 o'clock. Seth is planning on being there, so we might reschedule for a different night, maybe Wednesday or Thursday night, or me and Earl might push through. We might kind of do a live watch along at eight o'clock while we preview in uh, North Carolina FC and, and talk about maybe the first half of, of Lubbock. We haven't quite nailed on those details yet, but we will. So keep an eye out for our social media, probably over the weekend. We'll let you guys know, but in the meantime, everybody that was in the chat, Josh, Jane, whoever else I'm forgetting over here. Uh, thank you guys so much. It was a great night. It was a, an amazing win. I mean, just, I, I, I couldn't have scripted it any better. So, um, hopefully we can continue that. It's, it's nice to look at the table and see being third, you know, three wins already undefeated at home. It's a great start so far to Quill's first full season. And, and this team does feel different. It really does feel different, uh, from top to bottom. So, uh, we'll be looking forward to that. So next week, if you haven't heard, Lubbock Matadors, Rio Rancho High School, 7 o'clock. Tickets went on sale today, and I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of them, so you probably want to get yours as soon as possible if you want to go to that match. Uh, otherwise, we've got uh, North Carolina FC in two weeks, or two and a half weeks, two weekends, whatever you want to do, however you want to look at that. So tune in again, or tune into the social media for what we're going to do next week, and until the next time we come on, Somos Nidos, and if you want to listen to wrestling, uh, stick around because it was like a nine hour show over the weekend and we'll probably be here for about 11 hours discussing it. So uh, we love you guys. And so we'll see you. All right. All right so let's get to it. Let's do it. If you're sticking around, obviously the granddaddy of them all. So first off, first off, first off, Jacob's wrong because it was not nine hours. It was longer. Wasn't it? It was fucking 12. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there you go. 
uh, the granddaddy of them all. One of the probably the best, one of the best WrestleManias I've ever seen, if not the best WrestleMania. WrestleMania 40 happened over the weekend. If you're not a wrestling fan, uh, what you need to know number one, WrestleMania is now a two night event, or it's spread out over the course of a weekend, and then now includes NXT. We've got WWE Speed, which is happening on Wednesdays. We've got you know a two night main event. We had you had Bloodline, you had Cody, you had Rock, you had you know Jake. Uh, you had Logan Paul. You had all sorts of championships changing hands. I mean, Earl, I mean, I don't know where you want to start with this. Obviously, you're you're the bigger fan of the three of us. But and, and we threw a whole bunch of puns out last week on the show. People finished their stories. As just a truth finished his story. Congratulations to our truth and, and the Miz. I mean, it, so many things happened over this past weekend i mean earl let's let, where do you want to go with this well yeah, so i'm just gonna this. i'm gonna ramble real quick obviously um i have a six-year-old who's trying to sleep so i'm gonna make it quick and painless for real us quick. at least i did watch the reigns cody Rhodes match on sunday night that's literally all i watched of the thing i looked at the results the uh, an article about the results on saturday but i didn't watch any so unless we talk about that or until we talk about that match i'm not gonna be able to to contribute yeah. i will just uh sit here and make fun of you yeah so saturday was kind of a and if you watch the presser for on because i watched the pressers too so if you watch Jesus. the pressers so you took in like 30 hours over the weekend of wrestling content my goodness i sure did um i definitely took the wrestling needle and went straight straight in for those of you listening still if I were to show you the group messages that we have with me, Seth, Earl, and Harry, from whatever time on Saturday that it started, and even before and Jacob's it started nowhere to be found, all the way through Sunday late night, it's it's literally ninety eight percent wrestling, and then in the middle of one of the best matches in New Mexico United history, there are three <laughs> text messages about it, and they're all from me to the group. So, anyways, we anyways. know where these two hearts really lied this weekend. Like I told you, wrestling was my first marriage. Soccer came second. That hurts. It was El Paso. <laughs> you know, you also what also came first Nikki, before New Mexico. Nikki United? talks about this shield. This shield is where it's at. Yeah, it's not, you know what not, also came before New Mexico United? Uh, you did apparently, since you're having a baby. <laughs> Meatloaf. <laughs> that too. <laughs> Look, Anyways. it's the wrestling part of the pod. We're off the rails. Like I'm, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not doing anything to keep this on track. So I'm you guys either. can boot me, but I'm gonna be <laughs> all over the place. So, anyways, we're gonna start where it, where it all started. Um, Rhea Ripley, Be Rhea Ripley, and Becky Lynch. Um, I know that was a you that did. was a decent match. It was a That's very fine. decent I, match. I, I think. Uh, I don't know. I. I <laughs> I, I kind of felt like <laughs> wait, wait. Becky was. Are we seriously gonna go match by match? No. Okay. Becky didn't. Becky didn't right. seem okay in that match. I could be wrong. But. She. I. I read something. I read something. I'm gonna bring something to this pod. She it's had time. the flu. Mm -hmm. And I think that's it. Uh, Maybe there was something 100 else. And, 102 fever. Yeah, she had the flu. Yes, yeah. I contributed. There All you right. go. I'll be Good back job. in a minute. I contributed. So once let's talk. Leave. Just <laughs> pretty much. Um, so the six pack match, the ladder match. Mm -hmm. I honestly thought that we're gonna see some kind of legend return, like the Hardys or the Dudleys, or yeah, the Hardys or the Dudleys. Um, that obviously didn't happen, which I'm okay with. Um, because this first night was nothing but emotional runs like emotional jabs at your heart um seeing diy come out as dx yeah that, that was, was fucking great that was fucking great <laughs> um and obviously justin you said it truth finishing his story i mean that's his first major title and hey in in the 20 something years he's been with the company the tag titles are back with judgment day <laughs> anyways um yeah so seeing truth get his moment that was it, it was great um then later on in the mat later on the night 
Um, I want to say the very no. We're gonna skip the Rey Mysterio match. It's Rey Mysterio. Mm-hmm. He he's kind of old. Um, and then that's H- night hence, two. Hence the the tags under our names tonight. Yeah. <laughs> um, the Jimmy and Jay Uso match that was very very subpar. I think they yeah. cut it too short. Way too many super kicks. They build it brother versus brother. They they cut that one way too far down. Um, the one I want to talk about though, mm-hmm. uh, Maya's gonna kill me because I'm not talking about women's wrestling. I want to talk about the Sami Zayn shit. Mm. Okay, Sami Zayn night one went to war with probably Jacob's only fan, um, Gunter. You're muted. <laughs> yes, Gunther. There you go. I freaking love Gunther, dude. He's <laughs> massive. He's like my favorite he's, dude. He's really good. He, I, I expect him to get a main title push, like a championship put a WWE championship push, <laughs> um, or world heavyweight championship push, whatever, whatever's gonna be on Raw to the draft. Um, but Sammy Zayn. Yeah. So okay, yeah. There's, there's do a they draft, do the draft like, every year? Yeah, they do. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. So do you it's really the day, that was like a rare thing. It was like a every yeah, four or five every years four thing. or five year thing. Um, now it's a every year thing. They switch it all up, try to keep it fresh, which I like because sometimes rivalries get old, especially if you're a champion for thirteen hundred days. Who else do you have to beat except yourself? Um. So let me ask you this real quick. Do you think I, I can't imagine they put Cody on SmackDown? I can't imagine they put him there. So. You, you, I've got to think whoever more priests. I have to think priests and Judgment Day are going to are going to SmackDown. Yeah, I think. I think I think Judgment Day goes to SmackDown. If not, they break up Judgment Day and put Priest as himself on SmackDown. Mm-hmm. I think Priest can handle it. Kendall can handle himself alone. Um, I don't think he needs the backing of Finn Balor, Rhea Ripley, Dom, and uh, JD McDonough and our Truth. Um, because the fan said it last night. Yes, our truth is in Judgment Day. Yeah. I don't care what you say; he's <laughs> fucking in there. Um, but Sami Zayn and Gunther. I mean, Sami Zayn has worked his ass off for the past twelve years that he's been with WWE, and he's never had a major WrestleMania moment. Seeing him do it in front of his family, that fucking tore me. I was. Tears falling down my face. Um, yeah, I mean, Sami Zayn, I hope he has a decent run with the championship and it's not just a, a quick turnaround. Uh, so um, quickly on that, there's, so there's no chance that they're going to have him drop the title in Montreal next week to Chad Gable. No, okay. no way. And then the Sami Zayn, or the, the main event, we're going to talk about The Rock, Roman Reigns versus Seth freaking Rollins. And Cody Rhodes. Um, let me start off with this. I fucking hate The Rock. He's been so good. Yeah. I fucking this, hate this him. heel turn has been so good. I, yeah. Like he he's definitely playing his character. I get that. But he, I do not like his fucking character. I don't. Did you watch? Did well, you watch the, the documentary? Point. That is the whole yeah. point. The whole point is that you hate him. And so he's doing a fantastic Oh, I know. Job. I know. He's doing his job. That's for sure. But there was one part of the match where The Rock told the ref, mm-hmm. if you count me out or if you count, you're fired. You know The Rock. I don't fuck around. Um, I feel at, at this point, I'm going to sidetrack just a little bit. I feel fucking horrible for Peacock Network. <laughs> Look, Friday all, night. Everything is so, already on streaming. Why bleep everything? So Friday night, they had a deal with Paul Heyman. That was fun. Saying, telling people to suck his fucking dick. That dude, I'm t- his induction was in, was phenomenal. That yeah, was it definitely was. Um, how he beat the fucking phone over fucking Sting's head. I mean, I feel bad for Peacock because they had that, and then they had to deal with the Rock. <laughs> Saturday night, telling the ref that he'll be fucking fired. Mm-hmm. He's a rock. He don't fuck around. 
Um, Justin, I can't wait for it to go to Netflix too, because then I don't have to wait till Tuesday on Hulu to watch Monday Night Raw. I can just watch it live as it happens. Um, which also uh, Netflix will be streaming all the premium live events as well. Um, that was something that just came out. Mm-hmm. So it looks like they're cutting ties with Peacock and moving to Netflix, which is nice because then it's more more edgier content where you can actually say fuck. Um, but then The Rock just doing his thing and whipping the shit out of Cody Rhodes. I will, say, I, I will say, I will say, I was happy with the fact that there was no interference Saturday night. Yeah, I was definitely happy with that, but I mean, that was not the case came, Saturday night. No, that was not the case. <laughs> yes, yeah, so the interference came within the match. Like It was its own interference with the fucking rock doing his own fucking thing, which is cool. You know what? It's fine. Um, I'm happy with, I was actually, I was okay with night one. It was definitely a seven out of 10, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, Biscuits, come here. I don't know what he just said there. Um, but then night two. Oh, sorry, I wasn't muted. I was yelling at a dog. Sorry. <laughs> no, I think he's talking about Ju- he's talking about Justin. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then we get night two, where we have Stephanie McMahon who comes out and as Triple H and the presser, she still looks good. Yeah, I'm impressed with her being almost like 900 years old. She looks good still. Who? <laughs> um, Stephanie McMahon. Oh, biggest crush on her back in the day. Stephanie if you see her McMahon now, you probably still have it. Get I've right. seen her. Um, the Seth Rollins Drew McIntyre match. I think I seriously think Seth, Seth hurt. I think he picked up a legitimate injury. Mm-hmm. He is taking a hiatus, so I I have a feeling he picked up a serious injury. To where they had to drop it to him to Drew, and then turn around and do the cash in because they need Drew to have his moment at Clash of the Castle, Scotland. Well, now to be to be fair about this, I, I do want to say this. Damien has tried to cash in the money in the bank about thirteen thousand times since he won it last year, and they've failed miserably to do so every single time. Oh, I so know. I, I mean, I, his money in the bank run was definitely a joke. Mm-hmm. It was not serious. I think they had to do something with him. If you download the NBC app, you link it to your Hulu, you can watch Raw based on the East Coast time, and it starts at 6 hour time, ends at 9. Okay. Can you send that to me in Messenger? Even if you do it on... I mean, you can just send it to me personally. That's cool, too. Um, but carrying on. The street fight, we're going to pass over because that was subpar. You got Gangster Joe Jacob over there. Um, The LA Knight, yeah. We'll, we'll pass him that one. That yeah. was... It was better than what they hyped it to be. Or, yeah, it was better than what they hyped it to be. But LA Knight and AJ Styles are too subpar to where I didn't really care about that match. Yeah. Um, Kevin Owens, Logan Paul, Randy Orton. I'm going to leave it with, I'm going to leave it with one sentence. Two sentences. I cannot stand Logan Paul. But he is fucking talented. Yeah, he is. He has really taken to WWE and you know the fans and the interaction. As much as fans hate him, like he he through his experience with YouTube and everything else, he knows how to work a crowd. He knows how to get people's attention, and I, he he legitimately is bringing views to WWE without it. And then the fact that he he brings guys like Triple H onto his podcast and they talk about some of the things like in the pod in one of the more recent episodes, they talked about like how late the story came together and how, and it talks about in the documentary too, about how the story finished for Cody, how that storyline evolved and the rock got involved. Like it was, he really is. He's really, he's bought into it. I don't think this is just a thing for him. It's not like a fly by night thing. I mean, he's been with the, with the company, what, almost a year now. A little over a year, yeah. A little over a year, yeah. I was gonna say he's. I think he's legitimately bought into it. Um, and then obviously the reason why everyone watched and the reason why there was eleven 
million people watching on Sunday night. Um, thanks, Justin. Appreciate it. I got your message. Um, the Roman Reigns Cody Rhodes match, Bloodline rules, which where, where the fuck that means. Um, basically, no disqualification. <laughs> That's really yeah. all. Those two together put on a freaking show. That's for sure. Yeah, it was back and forth. With Roman Reigns' 1,300-day streak or 1,316-day streak, you kind of didn't expect him to lose. But then you don't expect them to screw Cody over and not finish the story. So it was I was very, very torn. Um, I've been a huge Cody Rhodes fan since he was in Legacy with Randy Orton and Ted DiBiase, if we can even say that name. Um, but it was... <sighs> It had me on the edge of my seat the entire time. Mm-hmm. And I expected outside interference because it's the bloodline. I wasn't sure what outside interference to expect from Cody Rhodes' side. I had heard rum- rumors and rumors and rumors. Um, so we obviously knew Jimmy Uso would interfere. Mm-hmm. So I expected Jey Uso. Uh, we expected Solo. So I expected John Cena because Solo was John Cena's last rival, last feud. Um, I expected The Rock as the final boss. He's the last guy to come out, tear apart the show. The person I didn't expect was The Undertaker. Who I expected to show up there was Stone Cold. Mm Mm-hmm. Given the Stone Cold Rock, Austin Rock rivalry for five WrestleManias in a row, um, seeing the Undertaker was nice. It was cool, but I think it was a little underhyped, given the magnitude of the main event. Um, and obviously, Seth Rollins coming out in the Shield. That was I expect to see Dean Ambrose for a little bit. That didn't happen, obviously. Um, but then the ending—that's the part that got me. Mm-hmm. Um, so because I'm a huge wrestling fan, I remember when Seth Rollins screwed over the shield and dismantled the shield with one swing of a chair. Um, with Roman Reigns needing to get revenge on Seth Rollins instead of take Cody Rhodes out and keep his title, that was the defin that was like the definition of WrestleMania moment. So, if you haven't watched, I'm sorry, I'm about to ruin it for you. Um, if you have watched, awesome. I'm glad you watched, along with 11 million other people. Um, Seth Rollins is in the ring still. Cody Ro- or Roman Reigns has a chair. He has the chance to take out Cody Rhodes with the chair, pin him, keep the title. Instead, he looks over, he sees Seth Rollins standing up, facing the audience, and Cody Rhodes takes a chair shot to the back as if it was 2012 Shield. Yeah, Seth Rollins, sorry. Um, takes a chair shot to the back as if it was 2020 or 2012 Shield. The 2016 Shield, whenever the Shield dismantled. Um with that. Cody Rhodes took advantage, hit Roman Reigns with three crossroads, and then immediately made Samantha Irvin, the ring announcer, cry. If you listen to the announcement, that's all you hear is Samantha Irvin's voice cracking, and I think that's the part that got me, because people think wrestling is just wrestling. Um, wrestling. Jacob probably thinks wrestling is wrestling. No, wrestling but, is storytelling. Exactly. That's all wrestling. Re- <laughs> wrestling tears at your soul, and it's a grown man soap opera. It's that's a hundred percent what it is, and I'm a hundred percent on board for it. I'm gonna ruin and the moment for just a second. Go ahead, asshole. The crossroads is the dumbest finishing move I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I have to disagree with you a little bit. Rikishi stink face. No, that's hilarious. That's great. <laughs> is it a finishing move that's really going to incapacitate it? Yes, of course it is. It's his ass. 
you can't tell me that a 300 pound man is going to stick his ass in your face and you're going to want to. I mean, just Justin's right. I'm going to disagree with you strongly with any of the rocks Ed, finishers, no, no, except no. for the sharpshooter. At least the people's, the people's elbow. elbow. The fuck is that? Like, obviously, we're, everything is with a huge grain of salt because it, it it's it's fake ish. Um, the people's elbow is at least like an elbow. It's like a strike. I don't. The crossroads looks like I don't. I don't. I don't even know what the hell it looks like. It is. Then what's the rock bottom? The rock. At least that's a body slam. I I don't know. The, Either like, way, the crossroads looks like it hurts Cody Rhodes more than it does the person that he's doing it to. You may have a point there. I'm yeah. telling you, I I was gonna come in and ruin the moment. I watched that <laughs> and I watched him do three in a row, and I was like, I'm I'm pretty sure I could run a mile after that. Um, but hey, to each his own. To each his own. So, anyways, like I said, I wouldn't keep this long because I do have a six year old. And the people's elbow at least has sleep. some show to it. Like it, it's got some flair. It's got the ripping the things off and throwing them, and it's the rock. Uh, this was just like, hey, let's huddle up, and then I'm gonna twist around and you're gonna act like i hurt you sorry go ahead go ahead um anyways uh like i said i will not keep this long because i have a six-year-old that's trying to sleep um so yeah so wrestlemania seth said it a while ago it was in my book this is my personal opinion i've always been a huge 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 fan of wrestlemania 17 if you haven't watched wrestlemania 17 and you have peacock Go watch it. Um, while you're at it, go watch the Becoming Immortal Bray Wyatt documentary. Oh, that, was, that was phenomenal. That will make you cry. For now, go watch um, it until it moves to Netflix. It'll still be there, I'm sure. Anyways, the Bray Wyatt one, I think, will be. The old WrestleManias will probably move to Netflix. Probably. But yeah, so watch WrestleMania 17 and compare it to WrestleMania 40. It's pretty damn close. Um, so my opinion, what I would say is WrestleMania 40 is number two. Um, but it's very, 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 very close to WrestleMania 17. Something happened. Jacob's excited. Don't know what it was. Did the Sorry, Rockies watching, finally win a game? No, I'm watching, um, Tigres versus Columbus crew in the CONCACAF cup quarterfinals i hate the name uh cocker calf champions cup sorry quarterfinals yeah. and it's in pks and so far tgs has missed both of theirs and columbus has made their only one there about to shoot the second so if you see me do this or look dejected it's you, you now you know why well cool oh, you can do it on your own because <laughs> that wraps up our wrestlemania talk because we just went through all the matches in a quick quick hurry um Earl, in all seriousness, like I understand what wrestling and wrestling means to you, not just like you personally, but I know you and your brother have a strong bond because of it and, and stuff like that. So I'm happy that you get to enjoy this stuff. I'm happy that we give you an outlet to talk about it just a little bit. Um, I, I wish that half of the emotion and dedication that you showed to the wrestling WrestleMania portion of this podcast could be translated to United podcasting, but, um, but I get it. I get it. <laughs> so a lot of it was actually on my phone and I was just going down the list, um, on what I remember from the matches. Um, yeah, if but they're boring you, matches. I probably got up to get food enough, or something. Fair enough. So. All right. With all of that being said, WrestleMania out of the way, New Mexico United out of the way, Jacob, Let's get us out of here quickly because it is late and Earl has to put him his old self to bed. Sweet. So the, we had, I don't even know if we lost viewers uh, according to our little icon that we can see. So thank you all for sticking around. You can see passionate Earl there um, with, with the WrestleMania talk. You can see uh, Seth still being a fantastic robot host um, throughout all of this. Uh, Justin, thank you for contributing to the WrestleMania chat, even though you didn't contribute to the United chat. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Jacob, the whole thing is to retain viewers. I'm just kidding, Justin. I love you. I love you. Um, Get us the fuck out of here, dude. No, thank you guys. Uh, as as we've said, for, as far as New Mexico United concerns, they play next Tuesday. Uh, we don't know our schedule for next time, but uh, until then, um, I was trying to think of a wrestling thing to say, and the only thing that came to my mind was, "Do you smell what the Rock is cooking?" And I didn't feel like doing that. So, Earl, do you have any wrestling sayings that you could get us out of here with? 
And that's the bottom line. Oh, I could have done that. Know, one. know your role. There we and go. shut your mouth. There you go. Good night, y'all. Love you.